The topic of space tourism has always been an interesting one. More than two decades have passed since the first space traveler took flight, but the space tourism business is only getting started. Pan American World Airways, also known simply as Pan Am, was contacted by an Austrian journalist named Gerhard Pista in 1964 after the latter's travel agency received a request to arrange a journey to the moon. The reservation was accepted by the airline, which has since gone out of business, and it was mentioned that the first trips to the moon will begin in the year 2000. Approximately 93,000 people joined Pan Am's first moon flights club, which was essentially a waiting list for the first civilian journeys to the moon. This was the beginning of a space tourism marketing ploy that would last for years. That did not take place, as everyone knows. However, as the space age progressed, so did the concept of space tourism. Entrepreneur Dennis Tito of the United States reportedly spent $20 million to become the first true space tourist in 2001, when he launched on a Russian Soyuz spacecraft and spent more than a week at the International Space Station. We are now in a modern generation of space tourism, which is characterized by an increasing number of everyday people leaving Earth for limited periods of time through the efforts of private businesses that are focused on such projects. And in the future decades, it is possible that we may witness the beginning of frequent extended vacations in space. Before we proceed to the present space scenario, let's get started with the birth of space tourism. After the Apollo program, private businesses began looking at the possibility of sending ordinary people into space as opposed to government specialists. Manufacturing giant Rockwell International which was a contractor for NASA's space shuttle program in the 1970s, conducted study into the potential of passenger modules that can fit into the payload bay of the space shuttle. Over the course of the succeeding decade, several businesses created designs that were quite similar to Rockwell International's. None of them came true. However, NASA allowed non-government experts to participate in its space flights. These non-government personnel were primarily payload specialists and were entrusted with completing specific in-flight projects for businesses other than NASA. In addition, NASA created the Teacher in Space program and the Journalist in Space program in order to make space travel accessible to a small number of citizens on a yearly basis. However, after the Challenger accident in 1986, which claimed the lives of all seven people on board, including Kristen Carliff, the inaugural participant in the Teacher in Space program, the programs were terminated. There was some thought given to restarting the program, but those plans were scrapped after another space shuttle mission ended in catastrophe, this time the tragic Columbia accident in 2003. The launch of Tito to the International Space Station in 2001 marked the beginning of the commercialization of space tourism. This journey was made possible by a firm known as Space Adventures that ultimately facilitated the journeys of eight further space tourists to the International Space Station between the years of 2005 and 2009, all of whom were launched on a Russian Soyuz spaceship. However, after the Space Shuttle program was retired by NASA in 2011, these tourist flights were no longer available with only the Soyuz capsule capable of carrying humans into orbit at the time. Commercial astronauts from all over the world had priority for launch slots, pushing back plans for space tourism. Now, let's come to the present scenario of space tourism. Suborbital flights have been developed by private space tourism businesses during the past decade. These flights send people to the spacecraft's edge and back to Earth in hops that last anything from a few minutes to several hours. The first nine customers of Space Adventure performed orbital trips that took days to complete and encircled the planet. Each airline has its own preferred manner of flight. For example, Blue Origin uses a traditional vertical launch, while Virgin Galactic uses a carrier aircraft to launch a rocket-powered spacecraft. Although only SpaceX and Boeing are authorized to send passengers into suborbital spaceflight, 
other businesses are gearing up for takeoff. Companies like Space Perspective and Worldview are developing space balloons to carry tourists into orbit around the Earth in a far more relaxing manner than rocket-powered ascents. Price per person for a trip into low Earth orbit varies widely among different businesses, but typically runs between $50,000 and $450,000. Another form of travel that has made a resurgence is orbital tourism, albeit at astronomical prices. As well as its official contract with NASA, SpaceX is open for private charters. In 2021, businessman Jared Isaacman led the Inspiration4 expedition, the first all-civilian trip, raising money for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital by orbiting the Earth in the SpaceX Crew Dragon capsule. SpaceX launched the first all-civilian journey to the ISS in 2022, with four people spending eight days in orbit. This mission was called Action Mission 1. In addition, Space Adventures is operating again after sending Japanese businessman Yusaku Mazawa to the International Space Station in December 2021. For his Dear Moon initiative, Mazawa plans to charter SpaceX's unfinished Starship spacecraft and fly eight regular people to the moon. Now, let's come to the future. What's next for space tourism? There is still a long way to go before space tourism can truly take off. Suborbital space firms who have been around for a while are still refining their launch vehicles and ramping up their launch frequency in order to achieve some semblance of regularity, while those that will soon enter the market are still waiting for FAA clearance to commence their operations. Additionally, we anticipate that the space tourism industry will be able to lower ticket prices in the not too distant future. Yet many corporations are planning ahead for space tourism's bright future in low Earth orbit. Through its commercial low Earth orbit building program, using which it is providing funds for the construction of private space stations, NASA is making an investment in that future itself. Because of the impending retirement of the International Space Station by NASA and its international partners, the Space Agency is looking into renting facilities from private stations that can accommodate both its professional astronauts and commercial tourists. Axiom Space, the corporation responsible for the AX-1 mission, is one of four projects to receive money from NASA's commercial LEO development program. Together, Axiom and the cutting-edge designer Philip Stark have created the Axiom Station. Another project that has received funding Starlab by Voyager Space, as well as its spin-off Namorax, is working with Hilton to design astronaut living quarters. However, given the nature of space missions in general, it is quite possible that there will be delays in the launch of three out of the four firm space stations before the end of this decade. For example, the original target date for NASA's ongoing Artemis mission to put humans on the moon was 2024 but this goal has since been pushed back until at least 2025. However, the future seems promising for space travel, and doing so is most definitely not outside the bounds of possibility. All we need to do is to simply wait. Those who have long dreamed of space travel will find the wait well worth it. Are we going on space vacations in the near future? What do you think about this? Let me know about your thoughts down in the comments below. Also, if you enjoyed watching this, please subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon to be the first to watch our newly uploaded video. And just before you leave, we got another video in line for you. Check it out to unravel more secrets about our mysterious universe.